This is Duke University. We are going to go ahead and get started, uh, but feel free to grab some more pizza uh, or drink if you need to during the uh, session here. So uh, I think I've probably seen almost all of you, but I know we have at least a couple of people that are new here. Uh, for those of you I haven't met, my name is Howie Ree, and uh, I work here at the Business School at the Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation, uh, where I'm the Managing Director, and I'm also an alum. I graduated from Fuqua in 2004, and this is the uh, Entrepreneurship Education Series. Uh, Tonight is one of many sessions that we've held. Um, just a note, so tonight uh, uh, we were gonna have two speakers, Patricia and Jay. Patricia contacted me uh, this afternoon and she is uh, very sick, so unfortunately she won't be joining us. So uh, we're gonna have Jay here though, luckily, and uh, that means we're gonna get a chance to spend a little bit more time with Jay, which I think is great. Um, so today is How to Start a Company, the story of snaptoes.com, not the story of Kaju Salon which is all right. Um, so uh, I'm gonna talk you through uh, the event schedule and then we're gonna have Vidan give a little uh, Duke Startup Challenge info session. I know most of you have seen that before, but the important thing is we're actually gonna take questions on competing in the Duke Startup Challenge. So uh, we've done this now for a couple weeks and it seems like a lot of people have kind of questions on how to compete in the Duke Startup Challenge, so we will take that. And then we'll turn it over to Jay to talk about his story. Um, so uh, just to show you where we are, so we've already had 12 events this year. Uh, there we are, 1028. Um, how many of you uh, are planning to compete in the Duke Startup Challenge in the elevated pitch competition? Let's just see a show of hands here. One, okay, about half of you. So uh, for those of you that are planning to compete, you know that the deadline is November 1st for entering or registering to compete, yes, you got it? Okay, great. Uh, and then for those of you that are not planning to compete, um, we have a bunch of kind of qualifying rounds that you can check out from November 3rd to November 11th. I encourage you to check out uh, those rounds and they're, they're gonna be fun. And the top 14 teams that win those rounds are gonna compete in a big event on November 12th, which will be here over in Janine Auditorium, just a few doors down. And that'll be with uh, David Thacker, who is a young alum who works at Greylock Partners, which is uh, one of the top VC firms in the world. Uh, they're investors in Facebook and Zipcar, LinkedIn, Pandora. So uh, they've kind of been, been lucky enough to invest in a lot of the top companies that, that you hear about nowadays. Um, and uh, actually, just one, in case that's not enough reason to come on November 12th, we are giving away a free Apple TV that night uh, by raffle. And everybody that attends is going to get a, a free Vuvuzela. You know what those, those are? The Vuvuzela is from the World Cup. That made those noise. So uh, come out and get a free branded Vuvuzela. We have uh, free food that night and uh, free drink, positive ID required. So uh, come check that out. I'm now going to invite Vidan to come up and talk. He'll do a quick. Uh, kind of thing on the Duke Startup Challenge, which for some of you will be uh, something you've seen already, and then we'll get into Q&A. Hi guys, uh, as Howie said, I'm Vida. I'm one of the four co-presidents of the Duke Startup Challenge. I'm an undergrad, I'm a junior at Pratt, I'm majoring in biomedical engineering. So um, the Duke Startup Challenge, as many of you know, is uh, the premier entrepreneurship event at Duke. It's called the Culminates in the uh, uh, in March, handing out the grand prize of twenty-five thousand dollars in March, uh, April. Sorry. For now, we have the uh, member competition, the elevator pitch competition, which for which the grand prize is uh, five thousand dollars. It attracts students from all over campus, uh, right from Fuqua to the undergrad parts, campus of Pratt and Trinity, and the Divinity School, Law School, Nicholas School. It is an extensive collaboration between students like me and Howie. Uh, we really can't do anything without Howie, so a hand for Howie. <laughs> uh, it was founded in 1999 uh, here at Fuqua and spread to other parts of campus. And the last three winners have been Wasabi Sushi, which were an all undergrad team the first time that happened, uh, Endogenetics before that, and Serene Biomedics before that. 
It has two annual competitions, as I said, one in the fall and one in the spring. One in the fall, oh, before I go into that, there are seven tracks, five functional tracks and two special interest tracks. The seven tracks are energy and environment, healthcare, life sciences, IT and media, social enterprise, and products and services. These basically entail the industry that your uh, startup is part of. Products and services is sort of the miscellaneous track if your startup does not fit into any of the other four categories. The undergraduate-led and the women-led uh, tracks are special interest which means that if, you, if your team is led by an undergrad or a woman, you can compete in both of those and one functional track. But you have to meet the qualifying criteria. Um, the elevator pitch competition this year runs from 3rd to 12th, rather than 4th, as it says there. It's a $5,000 grand prize. You have a minute to pitch your idea uh, to investors or entrepreneurs, and uh, they'll choose the best on each track and uh, they'll compete for the $5,000 on November 12th. And this year we have the Best Freshman Pitch Award for the freshmen in the room, and uh, that's new. And uh, then the spring competition is basically set up when the exec you submit executive summaries in uh, February, and then you submit business plans in March, and then make investor pitches, and the best of those are chosen for, to compete for the grand prize. And um, please compete, register by 11-1, uh, Duke Startup Challenge org, and I strongly encourage you to do that. Uh, this is a quote from Bill Maris. Uh, this is what he said, he was our keynote last uh, November. And this is what Eric Patzer, the VP of Intuit, uh, former CEO of Mint.com, which he sold to Intuit for $170 million. Uh, he was our keynote at, in our April event. Um, compete, you guys know you want to, so <laughs> I hand it back to Howie, uh, that's my contact, so thank you very Thanks. much. Stay up here with me, so uh, we will take uh, about three questions here, so does anybody have a question about the Duke Startup Challenge, competing, watching, well, mostly for competing, but uh, anybody have a question or did we answer all the questions? Anybody have a question on how to compete? Yes, in the back. So if you do the elevator pitch, are, are you supposed to... Need, do you need to continue on to the next stage, or can no. you just do that? Nice? Not at all. Yeah. Okay. Not Independent. All. You can just do the elevator pitch competition. The spring is we start over again, basically. Yeah. Question there. Um, can you compete in more than one track? You can compete in only one functional track, which were the. The first five here are the functional tracks, so you can only choose one of those, and everybody can compete in one functional track. But if you are an undergrad, you can compete also in the undergrad-led track. And if you're a woman, you can also compete in the women-led track. So are you an undergrad? Yeah. You are. So you can compete in <laughs> three, you can compete in three, two tracks. There are, I don't know why people are laughing, but there are a lot of undergrads <coughs> here, and a lot of, we had 40 undergrad teams compete last year, actually, which is great. So um, you can compete in, uh, in three tracks, actually. Undergrad, women, and a functional track. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And before we go to that, just a show of hands, let's just, we, we always do this, let's get a sense of our audience. How many of you are FUCA students? Raise your hand. About, so I'd say more than 50%. And how many of you are undergrads? And any other schools represented tonight? Nicholas. Nicholas? Or grad school. Grad school? Yeah. Rock on, right. Great. Good. So nice mix of people. Thank you. Couple questions here, yeah. Kate, you want to go first? Uh, are the judges the same for each track? The judges are not the same, and we're finalizing the judges, and uh, we'll stick that up online. So we'll let you know kind of um, after your, after your, after registration's closed. So, yeah. It'll be about two to five judges per track. Okay. Yeah. Is, is there any Q&A following the one minute pitch? One minute, you go ahead. One question, one minute and one question. One minute and one question. Any more questions? No, we got it? All right, cool. Um, the last thing I wanna uh, yeah. say is you can come watch any of the tracks. Yeah. Uh, that's not always clear to people, so please come out. And in fact, if you're competing, um, uh, realize that the judges choose one of the winners that advances the finals, but also the audience chooses one of the winners that advances the finals. So if you can get your friends to come out the night that you're pitching, you can actually get you know get yourself into the finals through that method. So uh, uh, please come out to all the track events that you'd like to, as well as the finals. So.
think we got everything covered? We good? Good, thanks. Nice Thank job. You. Okay, so I'm going to uh, turn it over to Jay here. Uh, by way of introduction, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about him. Uh, so Jay graduated from Trinity in 1990 and also got his MBA from Fuqua in 99. He was an econ major in 90. And uh, another thing that I won't, I won't try to say, but uh, the, the, yeah, maybe I don't think it exists anymore. Oh, it doesn't exist anymore. OK, so he was double major, but the econ is the thing that, that sticks around. Um, and uh, uh, after Fuqua, he went to uh, a company called Rapid Data, which uh, did you, you acquired it with Jesse? Or you, I, I know Jesse's. You acquired it from Jesse. You acquired it from Jesse. He acquired it from Jesse Lipson, who is a, uh, another entrepreneur that's spoken with us uh, last year, actually. It was a pharmaceutical market data company, and they ended up selling that. And now he's involved in a bunch of things. So you see here that he's involved with snap totes, which are custom photo handbags. But uh, what's not listed here is that he's also, invest he's also um, involved with a company called Thundershirts, which is for, uh, uh, for anxious dogs. How many of you own a dog or, or have a dog? Yeah. So some dogs are anxious and they're kind of skittish with like loud noises. So apparently if you wrap them in a tight shirt, they actually can like handle thunder and loud noises a lot better. So that's, that's what that company does. Uh, two more, two more. He has a company called Archimetrics, which does database mining. And lastly, he has a company called First Analytical Labs, which does trace metal testing. So pretty neat, lots of kind of very, very different uh, things that he's doing. So uh, we're gonna invite him up here. Please uh, join me in giving him a warm welcome. Well, thanks. Um, does this work? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, I also know Patricia. She and I were at Fuqua together. So if there are questions about Kaju, I might be able to answer some of those, but I'm not gonna pretend to know the uh, hair salon business very well. Um, and, you know, I, I told Howie when he told me that Patricia was unable to attend that, you know, given that and that uh, the amount of time I was expected to speak quickly doubled. Uh, I'm going to encourage questions. Uh, anything from, you know, if you're thinking of starting a business, what kind of legal entity makes sense to, you know, where do you go to get money to how do you find part-time employees. Uh, I have been fortunate enough to have been involved in, you know, seven or eight startups at this point. As Howie said, I have two business partners, and we currently have uh, we have a controlling interest in four companies and another fairly large investment in a fifth that does military lighting. So I've done a variety of things. My my background prior to Fuqua, I was an attorney. Uh, decided I did not like billing hours, uh, you know, 2,000 hours a year, and watching other people grow their companies. So came back to Fuqua with the you know intent of starting my own company. Uh, left Fuqua and went, I left Fuqua right in the middle of the, the dot-com heyday, uh, went to work for a local company that was backed by $60 million in venture capital. We spent all of that in 18 months and then shut the doors and I was fortunate enough to be the last man standing when the sheriff came to collect whatever was left in the building. Uh, so I, I've, I've, seen, I've seen the bust and I've also you know, been fortunate enough also to, to sell some companies and see some successes. So. To the extent you have any questions, just I think it'd be a lot easier if you did. When you have them, just raise your hand and we'll address them. Um, you know, as as Howie mentioned, we were fortunate enough to to sell a company a few years back, and at that time, one of my business partners, unfortunately, his stepfather passed away, and his stepfather at the time had owned a family business that had been in operation for over 80 years. They had started as a hat making business. Um, for those of you that are, you know, unfamiliar with the hat business, it pretty much disintegrated in, in the 60s. And I'm told through my partner, Ben, that when it really happened was JFK quit wearing hats, and as a result, men all over the country quit wearing hats. And his stepfather at that time, you know, the company was run by his grandfather, and he went into his grandfather and said, you know, <coughs> we're losing money hand over fist. Uh, no one's buying hats anymore. We have to do something different. And I think what we need to do is make handbags. And his grandfather laughed at him and said he would never make a handbag in his life. His grandfather came in the next day, and Ben's stepfather had taken a baseball hat to every single hat mold in the factory and said, now we have to make handbags. So uh, they had a very successful 20, 25 years making handbags. And 
At the time he passed away, it was a very different business. You know, almost all handbags now are made in Asia. Uh, very high-end ones are made in Europe. Very, very few are made in the U.S. <clears throat> so we were in a very niche market trying to figure out a way to survive. Uh, we were making handbags for, you know, people that wanted 50 handbags at a time. You know, if we were lucky, a big order was 500 handbags. Uh, our biggest customer was the U.S. military uh, because they insisted that their products be made in the U.S. And we looked at that and we said, you know, there, there's a reason you know, this business is going under and, you know, what can we do to keep it afloat? And there was a very small customer that was selling photo handbags for Sony. And we approached them and said, you know, you're the only business that really seems to be growing among our clients. Uh, would you be interested in selling us your business? And then we'll see what we can do with it. And for better or worse, they sold us their business and then we had to figure out what to do with it. And it is really the business of mass customization. If you're familiar with that concept, you know, the idea is making a custom product for a large number of people. So every single bag we make is unique. A customer will send us a digital photo or image. We will print it on fabric. We'll sew it into the handbag. And in less than two weeks, they'll have a custom photo handbag delivered to their door. Uh, what was very difficult was realizing that no one in the U.S. really knows how to sew anymore. Uh, it, you know, which meant that, you know, as our factory grew, we were really starting to bump up against a lot of issues. Uh, first and foremost, to the extent we could find people that were willing to sew, it was very expensive to hire them. Uh, uh, second, in the materials in the U.S., a lot of them were imported. By the time, you know, whoever imported them tacked on their profit margin, and you know, we were paying a lot for, for the materials alone. So we had to sit down and completely revamp our business. And we started that by originally going to China and having them make kits for us. So we have several factories in China, and what they do, essentially, they, they will sew the interior lining of the handbag, which is where most of our labor is, and then they will cut the exterior pieces, they'll put that in a bag, and then we import those. And we were originally importing those into our factory in downtown Durham, and you know, as demand continued to grow, our biggest issue was realizing that we're a very seasonal product. Mother's Day and Christmas, far and away, make or break our year. Christmas more so than Mother's Day. I mean, we will see our sales and traffic increase tenfold for the you know, four weeks you know, between Thanksgiving and Christmas. And, and we realized that there was really no way for us to manage going from a dozen people on the factory floor to 40 people on the factory floor for a matter of four weeks. Uh, one, no one wants to work for just four weeks. And two, we couldn't find that many experienced sewers. So we started looking around and saying, well, what can we do to solve that problem? And the first inclination was, well, we'll just make everything completely in Asia. And started talking to our factory there. They were interested. But then you realize, wow, it's really expensive to fly a handbag you know, via FedEx over so that we can you know, continue to deliver it in two weeks. Uh, so that took us back to the drawing board and led us to Mexico. And so we now have a factory in Juarez, Mexico which is convenient in that El Paso and Juarez, Mexico are essentially one large city. Um, we make everything in Juarez and ship it across the border daily and then drop it into the domestic FedEx system. So the entire business has really been about, you know, how, how do you execute on something where every single item is unique? And it really took a long time to, to figure out the best way to do that. Uh, we've got a system that works really well right now and you know, now, now the trick for us is, you know, how do we continue to grow the business? In 2008, not surprisingly, you know, the business or for anything that is a discretionary consumer item, you know, it, you just watched it go off a cliff in the fall of 2008. It, it started to stabilize, you know, in the spring of 2009, and, you know, it, it's slowly been coming back, but, you know, it's still not what it was two years ago. You know, so that leads us to, well, you know, how do we make a better online experience? You know, how do, we, how do we increase the amount of customization you can do? So really just try and push the user experience. And so we've been focused a lot on that. We've started looking at creating other sites that will target different demographics. And then what we did as a group, my two business partners and I said, okay, well, you know, we've got a lot of good ideas for the handbag business. 
but let's, you know, let's play devil's advocate. What, what if it doesn't come back? What do we do? And we said, well, you know, we get into some other businesses. So two years ago, we sat down and said, you know, it's going to be our, you know, our goal that once a week we're going to meet, meet with another entrepreneur, you know, a local business person who's trying to start a company and spend time learning what their business is and find some businesses that make sense for us to get into. The first one that we really put any significant money into is a company called Thundershirt. And, and it sounds funny, and, I, and I'll say that you know, I was the first to laugh when the idea was brought to us. And we have, let's see if this video plays. So this, will describe, this will do a better job describing it than I can ever do. You know, sometimes we dogs get anxious, fearful, or overexcited. We get scared of fireworks and thunderstorms, or anxious when someone leaves us alone. We shake, pant, drool, hide in bathtubs. It's really quite embarrassing. But even worse, some of us destroy furniture, jump through window panes, or run into traffic. That's downright dangerous, and it can cost our owners thousands of dollars in property and medical bills. But fortunately, there's an easy, safe, an inexpensive alternative that works with more than 80% of us dogs. Thundershirt. You put it on and instantly the shirt applies a constant gentle pressure to the body. Pressure is believed by experts to release a calming hormone which is comforting to living beings. And that's why Thundershirt has such a dramatic calming effect on most of us dogs. And it works instantly. You put it on, we calm down. That's like a giant wearable hug that never ends. Thundershirt is recommended by thousands of veterinarians and trainers around the world. It's completely safe and drug free. It's easy to use and comfortable to wear. It's available in a range of nice colors and sizes to fit most every dog. Thundershirt is just $36 with a money-back guarantee. Try it out risk-free. Your dog will love it. Thundershirt, the shirt that hugs your dog. So as I said, you know, when that idea was first brought to us, you know, I was like, yeah, you know, no one's going to buy that. And I have eaten those words, you know, over 100,000 times this year. So we've sold more than 100,000 of these in the last 12 months. And, you know, it, it really has been phenomenal. And I, I think what we took from that is, you know, if you can find a niche product and really give a solution to a problem, you know, you're 90% you're of the way there. And then, and then the key is getting the word out. Uh, for, this, for this product, Getting the word out for us meant going to dog trainers and to vets and getting it in their hands for free, letting them try it so they could start telling their customers and their patients, you know, about it. And, you know, now we're looking at, you know, potentially doing, you know, direct response television, you know, other, otherwise known as infomercials. So we may have an infomercial here in the next few months. And it's been interesting just to see, you know, how a, you know, a different consumer product can play in the marketplace. Uh, so between that and snap totes, you know, we've got a fair amount in the consumer goods industry. But we also said, well, let's diversify even further, and that led us into the environmental testing business. And, and we purchased, you know, rather than create, we purchased a company in this case. It was a business that had been run locally by the same person for the last 20 years. He had decided it was time for himself to retire. And we were approached by a business broker who said, you know, this may be something that's interesting. And the reason it was interesting to us is because of a few things. Again, it was a very niche market. Uh, it was something that we knew already had, you know, you know, proven capability to make money because the business had been around for 20 years. And it was a business that we could step in and own completely, which, you know, for, all, all, for both myself and my two business partners, having been very badly burned, <coughs> By working with venture capitalists, you know, we sort of made a, a vow that, you know, to the extent we can, you know, if we're going to do this again and have our own company, we're always going to own at least 51% of it. And that's not always the case with venture capital. 
they, they can be a fantastic friend, but also at the same time when things get tough, you know, they, they've got their investors to, to look out for more than, than uh, they're concerned about looking out for you in many instances. Um, so we got into the lab. The, lab, the labs worked well. It was a, a unique way to diversify. Uh, it was also a new business for us to learn about. I think all three of us are very ADHD. Uh, we're good for about three years in a business and then you know, we're, we're bored and want to do something else. Uh, so that led to the next thing, which is a company called Archimetrics. Archimetrics is focused on database mining. It's a very specific application uh, designed primarily for the financial and healthcare industries in situations where due to regulations, you can't append demographic information to uh, your database records. So we have a very unique statistical process that allows us to infer those demographics onto the records. Um, again, a very niche industry, something that you know, there's already a demand for, there's already earning money, and something that we could own a majority interest in. So that has sort of been our model. Um, you know, I would like to you know, maybe see if there are any questions at this point. Um, you know, yeah. um, when it comes to suppliers, especially uh, suppliers abroad, um, how, how do you go about um, looking for them and finding which ones best suit you? Do you have to fly over there? Um, do you shop around, or is there another yeah, we, way we, to do it? We've gone a, we've gone a couple different routes. Uh, originally, to find our first factory in China, we actually used an agent out of out of uh, South Korea. It was someone we were introduced to. He had worked for a long time uh, in the handbag industry, uh, sourcing for a variety of companies. So we hired him to help us find the right location, the right factories. Uh, so he was able to do that. Um, for Thundershirt, we took a very different approach. There are several online databases out there. Uh, Alibaba is probably the, the largest, if you're familiar with that. Um, but there are several like that as well, where you can look at products online. We found some that, you know, we're, we found about a half dozen companies that make life vests for dogs and approached them with our idea and said, is this something you can make? Um, we had all six of them make samples for us. Uh, we, you know, we paid for those samples. And then we actually sent our agent from South Korea you know, over to meet with them. Um, I've been to visit all the factories, you know, so we, we go over there occasionally. Uh, sourcing out of Mexico, uh, it was just it was a referral, word of mouth. We were working with a, another group in Tijuana, uh, asked them if they were interested. Uh, it wasn't quite a good fit, so they had recommended another group. Uh, and actually in, in Juarez, there is a, they've actually, uh, they've got a very well-established Maquiladora Association. Uh, you can approach them. They're, they're always help, happy to help you find a factory down there. Um, I, I mean, it's a very well-established business. Um, when, when, when it comes to working with these um, companies in these different countries, how does uh, patenting um, find its way into it, or does it at all? For instance, can one of these companies in China just decide they want to sell well, they, your product? Well, they certainly could. You know, with the, with the patent protection, you know, patent protection will give you protection in the specific country to which you've applied. So we're, we're very well protected in the U.S. We have, we have an international, the, the way it works, you know, you, you can also um, you know, essentially file an international patent, which will stay your patent applications to the individual countries for an additional 12 months. So we have that internationally. Uh, I think the short answer to your question is there are plenty of factories in China that are very quick to, to go out and make copies and sell them. Uh, you know, the trick is protecting your home market. Um, I think, you know, China is starting to crack down more. Uh, they recognize that to the extent they have a reputation for, you know, stealing intellectual property, people will be reluctant to, to take the higher end items there. And that's really what they're pushing. They want to get more into the high tech side of things. Uh, so I think they're, they're, they're really working very hard to, you know, establish, you know, a much stronger intellectual property protection program there. But it, it, it is still a gamble. Yes? Did you have any negative consumer backlash when you transferred your production from the U.S. to, uh, to China and then to Mexico? And maybe, I don't know how much repeat business you have, so maybe it's not so relevant. Uh, no, we, we do. Um, for, for the handbag business, our, the bulk of our repeat, repeat business comes from professional photographers 
who resell our product. And there was some backlash um, initially. But I think, you know, the key to them, quite frankly, I mean, they're concerned it's no longer made in the U.S. But, you know, there, there are two main concerns. Well, oh, it's actually three. It's quality, it's how fast can you turn it around, and how cheap can you get it to me. And so when all three of those improved, you know, the, the fact that it's not made in the U.S., you know, yeah, they, they were able to get over that. You know, would, would they like it to be made in the U.S.? Yes. Uh, I think where we hit bigger issues with professional photographers, quite frankly, uh, we've had some channel conflict. So we've had several large online retailers, uh, Costco Online, Shutterfly, and some others carry our products. And because Costco is so price conscious, I mean, they're, the markup on their products from what they purchase it for and what they turn around and sell it to is very minimal. Uh, a large part of their business model is making the money from their annual fee. Um, so, you know, I, it was more of a concern handling that when professional photographers saw what Costco was charging as opposed to what they were being charged. And the way we, the way we approach that, you know, it's, it's a private label product for Costco. Um, so, I mean, some of them realize it is our product, but, you know, we're very careful that, you know, there's no branding at all on the Costco site. As far as anyone knows, it's a Costco product. There's a Costco label in it. Um, but, you know, that, that's more where the, I think the backlash from some of our consumers is. Sorry, was that a hand? Nope. Oh, uh, yes, please. Thank you. Um, I see that uh, Thundershirt and the handbag business are uh, very understandable businesses. And now you're interested in going into statistical data mining. Um, what are your um, sort of uh, biggest concerns about going into something that's far more technical? Uh, um, to move a new venture. Well, I would be concerned if I was the one doing the technical side of things, which I'm not. Uh, we actually have, that idea came out of a professor here at Duke, and okay. he does all the technical side. Uh, we've actually partnered with another local company to do a lot of the, you know, actual backroom analysis. So that, that has been more putting together partnerships, finding the right people. And I think that you know, sort of goes to, you know, question, you know, it, to the extent any of you are thinking about starting a company, you know, you know, leverage what you know and then find people that are good at what you don't know or what you don't like to do. Uh, there are plenty of people out there, you know, especially in this day and age with easy access online via the internet who have very particular expertise and you can find them very easily and hire them for a lot less than you might imagine. So we actually have a lot of consultants that will help us on very specific things where, you know, really they are area experts. You know, so they have, they bring years and years of experience that, you know, we just don't have time to, to catch up with. Uh, so we will hire them. So, and we, we have a fantastic, you know, search engine optimization guy. We have a, a very good guy for, you know, social networking for Facebook, Twitter, that kind of thing. Um, on the technical side, you know, we have, we have, you know, several database people that work remotely, you know, all around the country that are able to do the analysis from, you know, presumably their basement or wherever they, you know, they're hiding. And, um, you know, so th those people are out there. They're, they're a lot easier to find now. And, you know, the key is, under you know, again, understanding what do you know and what don't you know. Thank you. And so, yes? Uh, what element do you think is the is the key to to uh, form the successful niche market in the hand, uh, photo handbag. Uh, I mean, for example, you can also need something like the photo phone case or photo T-shirt. But uh, why, why do why do we choose a handbag? Yeah. Um, well, part of it was the background of the company. It, it, it traditionally made handbags, and we have looked several times at expanding to other products. But there is a lot of competition for T-shirts, coffee mugs, mouse pads, that kind of thing. There are plenty of people that will make that. And that has really been a race to the bottom as far as cost. It's all about how, how cheap can you make it. And, you know, we like the fact that, you know, there are handbags out there, but they, there's probably only two or three competitors that custom make them and print the, print the fabric before they sew it into the handbag. 
The others just have blank, sort of like these, you know, almost like the tote bags you buy at a Harris Teeter, you know, if you, if you want to buy their reusable, you know, grocery bag. So there are plenty of people out there that will do something like that. But to do something more high end is, is a different story. And, you know, so the fact that we're doing that, you know, allows us to keep the margins where we want to. Uh, you know, the, the other option is to, to just go for volume, and that's not something we wanted to do. You know, we'd rather make fewer and charge more, um, and that, you know, that fortunately has worked out. Um, you know, pricing is always, you know, always first and foremost. You know, every, every day we struggle with pricing in every single company. You know, whether it's database mining, what do you charge? To you know, you know, what 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 will the consumer market bear on this? You know, how do you, how do you price it to wholesalers? You know, so you know, what do you do with multi-tier pricing? So there, I mean, you know, getting your pricing right is always going to be probably one of the biggest things you do it for any company. Um, you know, you don't want to charge too much that no one buys it, and at the same time, you know, you don't want to so undercut the market so that you're just the, the low cost provider. Yes. Uh, how do you forecast the demand for this business? Like you refer to your past experience or any kind of data in the industry? Um, that's an excellent question. I'd love to say I have this incredible model that, that we plug everything into. Um, the question was how do you how do we forecast demand and you know, frankly, you know, 50% of the time it's, you know, which way is the wind blowing? What do we think is going to happen this month? Um, you know, certainly you can, you can start to see, you know, some patterns. It takes a while to start to see those, uh, especially, you know, snap test, because it's so cyclical, you know, we probably had to get 24 months under our belt before we could really start forecasting, you know, the differences from month to month. Um, so it took a while. Uh, but I, I think, you know, the key for us in forecasting, you know, is you know really looking at the past couple months, because things tend to change so quickly in the economy. Uh, forecasting demand for something like an Archimetrics, which is, which is the database mining company, is much more difficult. Uh, it's a very long sales cycle. Um, I mean, we've been talking to the same financial service company now for 18 months. Uh, we think they're close to, to pulling the trigger on, on another deal. Um, but it's just such a long sales cycle that that's much more difficult. Yes? Uh, piggybacking off that question, coming back to snap totes, when you initially bought it, how did you, I guess, do your market research or like identify the customer and base even? Um, yeah, well, fortunately, we had, a, we had an existing customer of the company you know, who was already selling these. So they were selling them online for uh, you know, Sony Photo or something, something like that. Uh, and so when we approached them about purchasing their business, you know, the first thing we did was go to Sony, talk to them, you know, get their forecast. Uh, you know, there were two or three other companies out there. You know, we, you know, did what we could to sort of gauge, you know, what their sales were. Um, you know, I think that that was such an early business that we were buying. You know, I think to some extent there's always a leap of faith. You know, and for us, it was okay. We can see we can see the we can see the unique the uniqueness of this product. You know, we can see yes, other people have bought it either from a competitor or from Sony, so we know people you know buy into the idea. And part of the leap of faith we always take is that the three of us are going to be better able to market it and sell it than our competitors, and we're going to be able to figure out a way to make it cheaper and make it faster than our competitors. Um, and so I think having that, you know, sort of driving us as the goal to do those things, you know, allows us to sort of jump in and, you know, to some extent, you know, really just, you know, jump on faith. Yes? How do you and your partners determine what price to pay for a 51% stake in a company? Um, you know, obviously that's going to vary depending on the company. And, you know, you know, part, well, part, if, if we're buying an existing company, you know, you know the, the first thing we're going to do is get a sense from the current owner, you know, what they think it's worth. Um, you know, we will do some modeling. You know, okay, well, you know, show, show us what you've done in the past. You know, show us a growth trend. 
Okay, based on that, you know, here's here's some multiples we could look at. You know, we could look at multiples on, you know, cash flow. We could look at multiples on sales. You know, what what else? You know, does the industry sort of pay? You know, as far as multiples. So, to the extent we're buying a, a new company, it's very much based on you know what are those multiples and what makes sense in this marketplace. To the extent we're starting a new company or buying a just an idea from someone, uh, you know that that's more of a you know, a couple conversations, you know, it's a couple long conversations. You know, how much money do we need to, you know, either prove this idea or just as importantly, disprove it? Um, I mean, we've had a couple companies that we've invested in and, you know, three months into it, we say, there's no way this is going to do what we want or, oh my gosh, you know, you know, there's a guy in Florida that's been doing this for 10 years and, you know, he, he already has 90% of the market. Um, you know, you, you try and get all that up front during the due diligence, but, you know, sometimes you, you miss something. And so for, for getting involved with a new entrepreneur, you know, for us it's a, it's a matter of, you know, how much money are we going to need basically for the next six months? You know, how much, you know, what can we forecast as far as sales? And, you know, the other, the other key component for us is how involved does that person want to stay in the business? If the person wants to stay involved, then... Frankly, the price to us is a little higher. Uh, if that person, you know, just like coming up with the idea and wants to wash their hands of it and let us run with it, then that price is a little lower. Um, and so it, it really is, you know, it's, you know, it's more art than science if it's, you know, that kind of situation. Whereas with an existing company, it's probably more science than art. Um, why is it more, why is the price higher if the, if the, the guy who came up with the idea wants to stay in the company? Um, for us, because, you know, he, he's going to want to maintain a, a, higher, a higher interest because he's, he's working. Uh, we, will, we will never, our, our model is never to pay an entrepreneur, you know, to, to come work for the company. Uh, we expect them to contribute that as sweat equity and, until we're cash flow positive. And, and, and we do the same thing. We don't take any money out until we're cash flow positive. So we recognize that you know they're they're making an investment of their time and effort, and as a result, we're willing to, to put more money into the company up front, in recognition of that of that effort they're making. Yes. Um, can you tell a little bit more about marketing strategy besides the identify the customer, such as the promotion, advertising? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let's talk about. Maybe, maybe Thundershirt's a good example because that's a consumer product. Um, I think it gets a little different, you know, with more B2B play. Uh, but in the consumer space, you know, you know, our strategy initially for Thundershirt was, okay, we just need to do some, some very low-level branding. You know, we just need to get the word out there. We need to prove that people like this product. And we need to prove that not only to the marketplace but to ourselves. Um, so... You know, initially we did not spend a lot of money on traditional marketing. Uh, we were more focused on giving out free product, getting testimonials, you know, building building buzz, so to speak. Uh, you know, as we saw that things were working on that front, then we went to a more traditional marketing strategy. Um, you know, we we roughly budget about 20% of our sales towards marketing uh, for that company. Um, we do a lot of traditional print. Advertising, do a lot of online radio advertising. Uh, we've even done some billboards, very targeted. Uh, the marketing strategy for Thundershirt, given given the nature of the product, the first thing we did is we said, okay, you know, this is a, a product initially designed to help dogs who are fearful of thunderstorms. So we went to weather.com and we said, you know, let's find a thunderstorm map. You know, where are the thunderstorm centers? Uh, it was Florida, it was Texas, it was, you know, Oklahoma, you know, were sort of the big thunderstorm areas. And those are the markets we hit first. You know, we said if it's going to work anywhere, it's going to work in those markets. Uh, so we went to those, you know, did some traditional advertising. Uh, we always do some kind of offer in all our advertising so that we can track it. So there'll be a, you know, $5 off, $10 off coupon you know, use this code online when you order, and that way we can track and see which, you know, which advertising is effective, which isn't. Um, 
you know, and then from that, we then took the model and rolled it up across the United States and said, okay, you know, here, here, are, the, here are the channels that seem to be working for us. Um, not surprisingly, dog publications work well. Uh, going to vet shows works well. Um, you know, actually the billboards in the right areas have, have proven to work well, um, not only from as an overall awareness strategy, but also from driving sales. Uh, so, you know, that, uh, we do. Um, you know, social media is for us. We do it. Be, it's all, and I think you talk to a lot of people. Everyone does it sort of because they feel like they have to, like you have to be in that space. And I think a lot of people that would tell you that they haven't really figured out where the big money is on that. Uh, Facebook, far and away, is you know the most successful uh, for that. They've gotten into some very targeted advertising, which we have seen to be helpful. Um, you know, they know a lot about every every user on their their site. They know what they like, what they don't like, and they can do some very highly targeted advertising. Uh, so that that for us is starting to pay off. But having just a Facebook page and and fans, uh, it's nice to keep those people involved. Uh, but those are really sort of the, the product fanatics. Um, if you think about what pages you, know, you may be a fan of, you know, those are probably the, the products that you, know, you love more than any other product. And, that, and that's who you get attracted to your, your pages. And you know, the nice thing is some of them can be very active, some of them will spread the word for you, and you want to encourage that. Uh, we have referral programs for both our consumer products that have proven really successful. Um, whereby, you know, if you sign up for the program, you know, you get a unique code, and if your friend ever uses that code, uh, either for a discount or free shipping, it gets tracked back to your account, and we pay you, we pay you, a, you know, essentially a commission for every single sale that, you know, uses your own individual code. Um, so that, that, that is actually, you know, I don't, it's not perhaps what you would think of as social networking, but certainly work, traditional word of mouth that you know, we've been able to use some of the, the newer technologies to, to better track and define. And, and that's been incredibly successful for us. Um, I would maybe throw into social networking the whole idea of these group, group coupons, Groupon, Eversave, if you're familiar with those. Uh, that, that's been a phenomenon that we've watched and it's been really successful for us. We, we've tried that with Snaptotes. We haven't done it with Thundershirt. Uh, um, at least not yet, but Groupon is a, a very interesting idea, um, especially for people that are thinking about starting local businesses because they target individual markets and because they have so many users in every individual market. I mean, it's a fantastic program. They, they charge an arm and a leg, you know, to, to, to use their, their system, but to, to build, you know, that initial customer base I mean, I, I, I actually don't know that you could do it cheaper yourself through traditional marketing. So it's actually a phenomenal way to, to go about things. Yes? Uh, for each of the companies or the businesses you have, uh, what are the few things that are keeping you up at night? Uh, the number one thing that keeps me up at night is, you know, how do I get more sales tomorrow than what I had today? Uh, so it's always trying to come up with Know, at least one new thing to try the next day. You know, what, what's, you know, what, what's one avenue we haven't tried? So sales are, are obviously a huge thing for us. Um, and I think probably at the end of the day, it probably always comes back to sales. There, there are little things that'll keep me up. You know, maybe some technology issue isn't working for us. Those tend to be more short term. So if there's one thing that, you know, I always worry about, and both my partners always worry about, is you know what, 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 you know how do you get that next sale, and you know how, how do you get that next customer to the website? How do you get you know how do you get more of them to, to convert? You know you know what what can you do on that front? So for us, it's always about you know the next sale. Yes, I just was curious about the what it's been, what has it been like operationally to sort of ramp up very quickly when you've got, you know, over the last year, 100,000 orders coming through, you know, 
uh, I love a description of like, you know, did it start out like in January with like 5,000 and February started to like go to 50 and then like 100 and then like, were you always on the phone? Did you have to fly out? And Yeah, and now, that I mean, that's, and, I mean, that's a great question. And, you know, one of the great things about the internet is it allows you to, to prove the viability of a product fairly quickly. So, you know, we, we, get, it, we get our website up, you know, we, we start doing some advertising, getting people to the site, and we start seeing whether it's going to sell. We originally made all of the Thunder shirts in Juarez. We, we, we leveraged our, our factory there. And it quickly became apparent, you know, one, we could buy it cheaper by sourcing it out of China. And two, you know, we also realized that, you know, it, you know the volume was starting to increase. So, you know, I think fortunately we were ahead of the curve. You know, we, we, we saw that trend coming. You know, it took us about three months to, to find, you know, the two or three factories in China that we were comfortable with. Uh, it took another you know, month or two to, you know, approve the products and, and get our first shipment in. Uh, so, you know, it takes a while to ramp up to that. Um, but in the meantime, you know, we just had to, to realize, you know, what, what are the priorities? You know, how many shirts do we make today? How many handbags do we make today? You know, how can we get more people on the line? You know, are we willing to pay overtime or how does that affect our margins? Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it, it is, you know, operationally it is a challenge. Right. You know, how, how do you figure out, you know, how do you ex experience that growth? And I think the key is, you know, always trying to be one step ahead. So we are actually now, you know, looking at, okay, what, what, what's, the, what's the next source for us? You know, what, what happens if, you know, we, we max out the capacity at our, our existing factories? You know, where do we go next? Um, are there some benefits, perhaps, to bringing some of it back into Mexico and taking advantage of some of the NAFTA, you know, regulations? So, you know, it's always, I think the key is not to, not to go to sleep on it. You know, you know so we, we, have a, we have a weekly operational meeting sit down, talk about things, you know, what's working, what's not working, you know, how's our inventory looking, you know, so it's, it's more almost inventory management, you know, knowing when, okay, okay, we've, you know, we're at, we're at this level now, it's time to place our next order. Um, so it, it, it is hard to, to ramp up that quickly, but, you know, fortunately, I mean, I think having already had the factory in Mexico, having already had relationships in China, we were able to do it, you know, quicker. So it's really about sort of using your intuition about what's coming down the pike and making um, decisions or, or, or planning. I think so, I think some of it's being willing is being willing to, you know, make a bigger a bigger play than maybe current demand calls for. Um, right. And I understand. Okay, you know, we're we're we're, we're seeing this trajectory. We stay on this trajectory. You know, there's no way we're going to be able to keep doing it in Mexico. Let's figure out where we're going to go. Okay, they have a minimum order that you know seems a bit high to us. Um, you know, the nice thing is, well, you know, e even if we sit on that inventory for six months instead of two months, it's okay. You know, it, you know, we'll pay some carrying costs, but you know, it's, it's not it's not something that's going to become obsolete. We'll be able to sell it. So, which which is a nice thing about this product. This has been great. Just let me pause for a second. So, um, a couple things. So, one is that uh, so we usually have one speaker. For those of you that come regularly, we usually have one speaker and we usually end at eight. So, we have two speakers tonight. We're going to end at eight thirty. So, um, I say we uh, kind of split the difference here and maybe let's do three more group questions uh, and then maybe Jay, if you want, you could stay after and yeah. maybe talk to people individually a little bit. And the other thing is that um, uh, we have feedback forms. Um, on the back of your handout. So if you wouldn't all mind uh, ripping that off and uh, filling that out for us while we do these last few questions. In particular, um, we'd, I'd be really interested to know um, how you like this format versus the other formats that we've done. Uh, usually we do you know, slides and usually it's more of like a 45 minute talk with a little bit of Q&A. This has been a 20 minute, maybe 15, 20 minute talk and a lot of Q&A. I think it's been great, but I, I want to know kind of how you've felt about it. So please give us some feedback while we're doing the last few questions here. Let's take three more group questions, and then uh, we'll kind of call it a night, and uh, you guys can stay after and ask individual questions if you want. So three more questions here. Yes. Um, 
curious about your relationships with your business partners. Have you maintained the same relationships or have you chosen specific people for different ventures? Uh, that's, that's a good question and a lot of people ask that. Uh, there are three of us that are involved in all the businesses together. Um, and you know, we're just fortunate that we've known each other a long time, get along really well, and I think know each other well enough that we're also honest and can say, yeah, you're doing this and it's driving me crazy or, you know, to that extent. Um, and, and we also, I think, we complement each other. My, my background is more legal, finance, operations. Uh, my, my partner, Ben, is fantastic at sales. Uh, my other partner, Chris, uh, really, you know, his, his background, he, he, had, he had worked for Leo Burnett doing marketing for a long time prior to that. He actually happened to be a, a Chinese major undergrad. He speaks Mandarin, which has come in fantastically helpful. Uh, so given the businesses we have, we tend to complement each other very well. And, you know, again, we, we just, we get along. Um, as we have new businesses, sometimes we get other partners in. Uh, you know, there sometimes it gets tricky, uh, you know, just because they don't have the background that the three of us have together. Um, but I think that, you know, the, the thing that, you know, helps us, you know, in those situations is recognizing that as well. And also, I think, making an effort that, you know, it is always an open discussion. You know, whatever said is fair, fair game. And, you know, no, no one should leave whatever meeting with hurt feelings. It's, it's, all, it's all said in, you know, bettering the business. I think if you can keep that in mind, it, it really helps. Yes? So, um, Thundershirt and um, let's see, the one, Snap Totes, they're both reliant on online retailing. So I was wondering, um, like, what would you say are a few key elements that distinguish online retailing from, like, the in-store in terms of, like, gaming consumers, um, I guess, like, marketing? And then, like, do you have an idea of, like, which products would work better being sold in-store versus, like, online? Um, yeah, well, you know, fortunately, both products have also been distributed through stores. Um, you know, the, the, the great thing about the web is that you're, you're making that sale directly to a consumer. So you're, you're capturing the entire margin. Uh, you know, you will pay to attract those customers, whether it's through search engine, paid search engines, online advertising, or even traditional advertising and driving people to the web. Um, but traditionally, I think you, you'll capture a lot more there than you would, you know, selling it through a distributor or, you know, a wholesale relationship. Uh, you know, as a, as a rule of thumb in the consumer goods industry, you know, there's this concept of keystoning where, you know, a retailer will double, you know, typically at a minimum, will double whatever they pay for a product, you know, when they put it on the floor. So if we're charging $10 to the retailer, they're going to charge 20 and you need to recognize, you know, if that's the route you're going, that's sort of what your margins are. And if you're going to use a distributor to get you into the retailer, they're also taking a piece of that. So maybe now you sell it to the distributor for eight. You know, they sell it to the store for ten. The store sells it for twenty. Um, you know, whereas if you sell it directly online, you know, you get the full twenty less, you know, whatever you paid to get them there, um, which is typically going to be a lot less. Um, you know, one of the advantages, one of the other advantages to the online uh, selling, I think, is just the amount of information you can give a customer. Um, I think consumers are very information driven. Uh, they want to be able to know as much about a product as possible. You've got lots of people that are out there. You know, if they can, if they can buy your product on 20 sites, they're, they're going to, or, or you have 20 competitors, they're going to look and say, okay, what, you know. A lot of people use the web to do their, their background research. You know, why, why this product? You know, are there reviews online? Um, we, ha we have reviews on both of our sites. Uh, customer reviews are probably one of the most popular parts of our site. Um, another advantage to online sales is just how much information you, you know, as, as a consumer goods company can gain about your customers. Uh, so we track, you know, how people go through our site um, you know, we, we know what, what the, the most popular patterns are, what works, what doesn't work, you know, what, what certain demographics are attracted to. Uh, and, you know, then, you know, another advantage to online 
sales is being able to you know, target your message to a much smaller market. So you don't have to have one message that sort of fits everybody. Um, we will have many sites within our site that are targeted to particular people. So if someone loves cats, you know, if they type in, you know, cat photo bag, we're going to take them to a page that has bags with cats on it so that they aren't seeing bags with kids or, you know, designs or travel pictures on it. So you can really focus people in, um, and I think that's a, a huge advantage of, of selling online. Yes? Uh, in terms of pricing, what kind of strategy you set up your uh, product price at the beginning? Because as you said, it's very difficult to forecast demand in the very beginning of the business. So it's like you build the price up on costs, or it's like you compare the price with other competitors in the market? We, we usually build our price, we usually start from the bottom and build up on pricing. So we start by determining, okay, what, what does it cost us to manufacture this product? You know, what is it, you know, what associated cost do we have? You know, what, 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 is, what does one individual co product essentially cost us to sell to someone? Uh, we'll then add the margins we want to capture to that, and that essentially becomes our distributor price. And from there, you know, you start adding the other margins. Okay, well, if, okay, so here's our distributor price. Here's what it would sell to to a wholesaler, and then here's what it would sell to to a consumer, you know, just using, you know, the traditional markups. But then do you do a little bit like market research to prove? As far as, as, as far as what price is set? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So we'll look at the competition. Uh, it is not our goal to necessarily be the lowest price. Um, you know, one, because we have no desire to start a price war you know, with any of our competitors. And two, I think there's a perception that, you know, if you're the lowest price, maybe your quality is a little less. And especially for the handbag business, that's not something we want to we want to play in. Uh, quality is a, a huge part of, of what we sell. Um, so, you know, we absolutely look at the competition, determine what their pricing is, and keep ours in line with that. Uh, if it's a new product, you know, the best thing you can do is go out there and try and find something comparable. Um, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, and then, uh, you know, another great thing about selling online is your ability to, to try out new things. So, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe early on, you, you, you know, you know, there, there's this whole concept of A-B testing. So maybe half the people see a $36 price with undershirt and half the people see $40. And we'll track and see, okay, how does that affect our conversion rates? Um, you know, are we getting the same conversion rate for, at $40 as we are for 36? Then, you know, we're, we're stupid not to charge 40. Um, so you, you can really, you really can get a lot of metrics out of selling online. Uh, and it's just, you know, it's really just an incredible focus group. You know, you, just how much you can do as far as you know, splitting things and directing people certain paths. That's great. And I am going to uh, ask the, actually, add a, one bonus question, which I'll ask, which is, uh, do you have advice for the undergrads here and the grads, grad students separately as to, or, or maybe the same advice as to uh, uh, what you would suggest for them in terms of you know, the thinking of starting a company while they're students? What would be like a good first step for them or a good Maybe you wish you had looked at Yeah, um, I mean, I guess the, the, the overarching thing would perhaps be don't overanalyze, don't overthink it. You know, get out there. If, if people are liking your idea, you're getting some good feedback, you know, jump in and give it a try. Um, you, you know, Hopefully, hopefully it'll, it'll be more successful than you, than you could ever dream. But at the same time, you know, just getting out and trying, you'll learn a lot. And if you've got the kind of personality that, you know, really wants to own your own business and run your own business, you know, the best thing you can do is just sort of jump in there and, and give it a try. That'd probably be my main advice. Uh, you know, because there'll, there'll always be people there that say, that's a, that's a dumb idea, don't do that, are you silly, you know. You know, go go get a traditional job, and then and then you then you can start your own company. And I think 
once you once you start going that path, it gets harder and harder to leave. You know, you get used to you know the regular paycheck. You get used to you know the things regular paychecks buy, and you know so the sooner you can jump in and give it a try and really see if it's something you like, you know, I would say definitely do it. Well, please join me in giving Jay a hand. I thought that was a nice Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.